Hey, welcome back. This is Joel Duff. I'm hanging out on the website of Answers in Genesis where they have this recent article, and I thought this would uh, be appropriate for a, a uh, episode of Critiquing Creationism. Now, we're not going to be dealing with science here at all. We're dealing with a whole different type of question, and I'm going to be responding to that question, not as a scientist, but as a Christian. How do I react to these types of articles and Answers in Genesis as a Christian, as a person of faith? And so... Um, You'll both see the, the depth of the types of theological uh, answers you get from answers in Genesis. You see it from the title of this article, it's asking a really important question. How do I stay humble when I know I'm right? I think, I think we've all probably experienced this, right? You, there are things that you know you're right about. I, I certainly have things where I, I feel like I am right on a particular topic or issue or idea or a theological point, right? I feel like I'm right. Somebody else is wrong. And you just want to kind of go up to them and shake them and, you know, tell them why they're wrong. As, as much as you might care for them to know the truth, it's difficult to be humble about your own knowledge, my own, my own surety in the knowledge that I have, right? So this, this is a this is a very difficult thing to do. It's a difficult form of communication, staying humble while knowing that you're right. Of course, the question we're going to be addressing here is, how do you know when you're right? <laughs> you know, that's, that, that, that's kind of the big thing. But this, this is an important question. And, you know, of course, this is on the Answers in Genesis website, and you know what this is going to entail. This is about, hey, we're right about creation. We're right about the age of the earth. We're right about the origin of organisms. We're right about a bunch of these different things. We're absolutely right, and we know it. And so how do we stay humble? And many of you are thinking, but they don't stay humble. And, and I would agree. There's, you know, there's a lot of arrogance at Answers in Genesis. Arrogance in their belief that they're right. Um, so you might think that this was a this might be an article of introspection, of kind of like an almost self-reflection for themselves. All right, we, we know we're right, but how do we stay humble in our presentation and how we how we approach those who haven't come to understand our correctness, our rightness, right? They haven't they don't understand our truth yet. Unfortunately, that's not really where this article goes. Um uh, Let's find out. It's a very short article. I think what I want to do is I want to I want to read this for you. And then, as I said before, I'm going to comment on it as, as a Christian. How do I react to the argumentation that's made here? All right, this article is by uh, Todd Friel. Uh, Todd Friel is a, um, he's a internet apologist, pseudo-pastor, uh, has an apologetics ministry. He hangs around with Ray Comfort, if you know who Ray Comfort is. So that'll give you some idea of his methodology, all right, his style of argumentation. So he begins with this, what a lot of pastors do, right? They have some kind of illustration. And even before I read it, I'm just going to tell you what this reminds me of. This reminds me of a, of a, of a, of a pastor who um, runs across a story or has a personal anecdote, right? Something that happened to them. And then they're searching for how they can work this into their sermon, right? In other words, they don't have the message that they've derived from this piece of scripture that they're working through and realizing they have something that would help illustrate that. It's more like they came up with an illustration first and then they're trying to work it in. And you know what happens when you do that? Often it doesn't quite fit. It's almost like, I got a great story. Now, how, how can I make this work? And a lot of times you're left thinking, boy, that, that didn't really work. And that's the way I feel about the beginning of this article and then where it goes. Meet Bob. Bob booked a vacation, discount vacation to Phoenix that went terribly wrong when the Our Arizona Vacations Are Hot, Hot, Hot tour bus broke down. Bob and his fellow cheapskates decided to walk to Tucson. By the way, no one's getting out of the bus tour and walking to, to, to Tucson. So it's a very unrealistic story to begin with. But without warning, a sandstorm kicked up and Bob and 49 other skin flints were scattered throughout the Sonoran Desert. 
they took off in different directions because they were confused by this, this sandstorm. Thirst from the scorching sun had almost driven Bob mad when, they, when the rescue squad appeared and administered an IV. He quickly recovered as the crew located another lost soul whose tongue was virtually stuck to the roof of her mouth. Bob pointed at her and howled, look at your tongue, what a loser. I would never get lost like you. Kind of over, I mean, so the point, right, is you would think that Bob is either forgetful or very arrogant, right? He was just in the same predicament and he's making fun of someone else that's in the same predicament. Um, he knew that he was wrong and he was lucky and he was the recipient of grace, right? That, that this, uh, that he was, he was, he was saved in a way. And he's making fun of others for their stumbles, you know, for their sins, kind of like he had his own sins. I guess that's probably what he's kind of trying to get at uh, in the story. The Apostle Paul would rightly have asked him, what do you have that you did not receive? I think it's quite a stretch as to, you know, the, the theological context here uh, in, in First Romans. But yes, what do you have that you did not receive? Um, yeah, it's not of your own volition that you were saved. You were saved because others were looking for you and saved you, right? This, this rescue team came to get you. You didn't save yourself. You were in dire need. So why make fun of others that are in dire need? Now, how is this all going to connect to our question, right? How do I stay humble when I know I'm right? How do I stay humble when I know I'm right? Right. Well, I mean, obviously, Bob should have been humbled by the fact that he had been saved from this disaster rather than simply take an opportunity to make fun of others who were also in need of being saved. I don't, that's certainly not terribly profound, and it's certainly not really going to help me a whole lot in terms of my interactions on this particular topic of I, how do I know when I'm right? How do I stay humble? How does that fit with the like, I know I'm right about something. I mean, what did Bob know he was right about? I mean, that, I don't see where that enters into the story. But, uh, okay, let's forget the story. This story is not important, <laughs> really. I'm mostly just making fun of the fact that the story hardly connects to the rest of the this very short blog post. Do you know why godly creation scientists believe God created the world in 24, uh, six 24-hour days? Now, here's, here's what spurred me to make this video. It is what inspired me was this question and the answer to this question. Right? So he gives three options. Why do godly creation scientists believe God created the world in 20, six 24 hour days? Yeah. I think if I asked you that question, you, you would come up with some possible answers to that. But here, here are the three that he gives. They're brilliant. You know, it's their brilliance that allows them to see the truth that the world is very young as opposed to the rest of the world which is doesn't is not endowed with the capacity right with the mental acuity to be able to uh, discern this the evidence in the right way right b is actually so to me kind of related potentially to a which is they have phd's right only phd's can truly understand this and and right the the super good godly creation scientists, we know that lots of creation scientists have PhDs. So it's kind of another way of pointing out that like, hey, creation scientists have PhDs. Or C, maybe it is that they understand the plain meaning of Genesis 1 and 2. In other words, they, they are able to look at scriptures and they understand that meaning of Genesis 1 and 2. Right? What, what a, which one of these? Or all of the above? Well, all three of these options may be true. Right, you know, yeah, Christian creation scientists have all these things going in their favor. Favor. The real reason why they know the earth is young is that the Holy Spirit taught them the truth. The Holy Spirit taught them the truth. So we quote First Corinthians two fourteen. The natural person, right? The person of nature whose heart has not been changed. That was one one that has a heart that has fallen and fallen away from God does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, right? The Spirit, the Holy Ghost, one of the members of the Trinity, in other words, God, right? Doesn't accept the things of God, for they are folly to him. 
and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. So ultimately what he's saying is, um, in order to have the eyes to be able to see that the world is young, the Holy Spirit has to have shown you that. In other words, God has to have shown you that. It had to be spiritually discerned. And without the aid of the Holy Spirit, it doesn't matter whether you are brilliant. It doesn't matter whether you have a PhD or not. It doesn't even matter that you can see the plain meaning of Genesis 1 and 2, really, because he's saying all these things may be true, but, right? So he's not saying that they're simply looking at scriptures and reading them in a plain sense way and deriving from that that the world is young. Yes, they might see that the world's young, but do they really believe that? Do they really know that? Do they really have confidence in that? Oh, and going back to the beginning, how do they know they're right? Because that's that's the real question here. How do you know when you're right? Because you know when you're right, you're right. And only those things you've been taught by the Holy Spirit can you have utter confidence in that you are right. And so if you have the truth straight from God, well, then you're right. How do you stay humble in that situation? All right, so back to back to see real quick here. They understand the plain meaning of Genesis 1 and 2. So they could see the plain meaning, but until God writes on their heart that this is the truth, right, helps them fully understand that and have absolute confidence in what they perceive with their eyes and their and their minds, and their minds are potentially fallen, corrupted minds. So even reading Genesis 1 and 2. Uh, and even coming to some conclusion that the world is young isn't doesn't have the level of confidence that you would have if you had the Holy Spirit that also is reinforcing that within you and giving you confidence in that interpretation. Yes, creation scientists are intelligent, but there are plenty of other intelligent men and women who believe the earth is old or evolved all by itself. The, the real difference between young earth creationists and some like Stephen Hawking's or Neil deGrasse Tyson is the Holy Spirit. That is the answer to our question. How can I be humble? Okay, okay, so that's the answer to the question. He's saying right here, how can I be humble when I know I'm right? We are right only because God has taught us to know what is right. How quickly we can forget and become just like Bob. So how quickly? So like Bob didn't have the Holy Spirit and therefore didn't recognize who his true savior was, I guess, in that situation of desperate need, uh, and therefore turned on others and, you know, prideful or covering over his own insecurities or whatever, spoke out and wasn't humble. But if he had known the truth, right, if the Holy Spirit had shown him what he had been given, then he would have loved others. Uh, now, I think that that's, perf that's a perfectly fine thought. I think that that's uh, absolutely true, all right? That that's what we would um, desire the Holy Spirit to do within us, is work in us a new heart that would express love to others and understanding, all right? And remove those stumbling blocks and help us to not be arrogant uh, and treat others not as as not as we would want to be treated. So here he's he's saying knowledge makes well he's using a scriptural reference First Corinthians eight one knowledge makes arrogant. Right? If you just have a PhD and if you're just brilliant, okay, you know, then that knowledge will make you arrogant. Because if you don't combine it with love, if you don't kind of with a true understanding of where that knowledge came from and truly uh, give credit to how you came to that knowledge, who gifted you with the ability to understand those things, then you're going to be arrogant because you're going to feel like that's my own knowledge, that's my own doing. Right? And ultimately that's his, his answer, which I don't, I don't think is a terrible answer at all to how do I stay so humble right, when I know I'm right. right? If you have knowledge uh, through the Holy Spirit and able to show love through that, you know, if, if you're able to edify through that, that's great. Um, but let's let's think about this a little bit more as, as soon as I finish this up. Let's just, we're almost done here uh, with, the, with the reading. 
The next time you engage a theological debate in a theological debate, don't think about Bob. Instead, remember Jesus, who said, I am the vine, you are the branches, whoever abides in me and I in him. He it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. That will keep you humble when you know you're right. Okay, you know, I kind of like, as a very, very generic and sort of an ultimate truth sort of sense that um, knowing who Jesus is and knowing where real truth comes from um, and being able to acknowledge that removes the arrogance in us that it's our own like doing it's our own brilliance our own and we're going to become confident in ourselves and if you're not confident in yourselves and you're giving credit to the true creator of knowledge then you are more likely to bear fruit and you're more likely to be humble in that knowledge rather than arrogant in it so i like kind of like like i'm fine with the overall message but it's but now Let's get down to the brass tacks of when I know that I'm right. All right, now how do you know you're right? You know you're right because the Holy Spirit has led you to that. Now, the, the, the problem, the question always becomes, how do you know that you're feeling, all right? Your intuition that you're right about something is has been directed to you by the Holy Spirit and isn't simply your arrogance, you know, and feeling that you're right. And so let me think, let's, let's think about um, what can happen here. All right, what, about, what do I think, are, what is my critique of this article? Um, let's start out with the primacy of divine revelation. All right, what is this article doing? This article is asserting that the primary reason for believing in young earth creationists, because that's where, I mean, this, this is about young earth creationism, really. It's really trying to help those who believe in a young earth. We started there, right? How do godly creation scientists believe? How do they, why do they believe that God created the world in 24 hour days? Because the Holy Spirit taught them the truth. So this article says that this is the truth and the Holy Spirit is teaching them that truth. The Holy Spirit cannot teach untruth because the Holy Spirit is a member of the Godhead. All right, so the Holy Spirit cannot, you know, teach untruth. So therefore, if you believe that you derive that from the Holy Spirit, then you know it's true. And you're going to have absolute confidence in that. Um, so what I'm saying here is the primary belief, reason for believing in a young earth creation is spiritual illumination then by the Holy Spirit rather than scientific or academic credentials. Okay, all right, great. This reflects a theological view that prioritizes divine revelation over human reason and empirical evidence, and I'm kind of okay with that. I mean, ultimately, yes, I do believe that uh, divine revelation trumps all those other things because it's superior to human reason and empirical evidence. Now, I do believe that empirical evidence should, um, should support divine revelation it shouldn't be in con it shouldn't con it shouldn't conflict with divine true divine revelation um now because of our inability to have perfect reasoning and we don't have perfect knowledge we might not have all the information to be able to interpret the data such that we uh th that it it looks like in conflict but it actually isn't and maybe in our lifetime we'll never figure that out Right, so, so divine revelation trumps it. But we still have this issue of you still have to know what divine revelation is. And that requires interpretation too. And that requires interpretation using what? <laughs> Our human reasoning. Right, this is always the challenge right, with scriptural interpretation is that part of it is us. Now, as this author is saying, the Holy Spirit may be guiding one. But the Holy Spirit has guided many Christians to different viewpoints. Hmm. Has the Holy Spirit done that? Uh, no, human reason has done that. Holy Spirit has helped guide those to greater truths, but we haven't all come to the truth and we can all agree on the truth. And we're not going to know in this present world, you know, all of the truths. There's going to be unknowns. 
And the, the, the big question here is whether the age of the Earth is an unknown, or is this something that absolutely can be known because the Holy Spirit is guiding certain individuals to that absolute truth, and then they are proclaiming that truth with confidence, and all of us should be conforming to that. All of us being all of the Christians should be conforming to that particular truth because, um, and, and basically praying that the Holy Spirit will help us, help guide us to that same vision, that same understanding of that truth. All right, so that's that's a biggie, all right? Uh, that that um, it's the relationship of divine revelation versus empirical evidence and human reasoning. Uh, but of course, now we have to talk about the interpretation of Genesis, right? This article assumes what? It assumes a particular form of literal interpretation of Genesis 1 and 2 is the correct interpretation, right? Treating the six days as creation and six 24-hour days. And this hermeneutical approach, this method of interpreting scriptures is definitely not universally accepted among Christian theologians and scholars. And, and I'll, I'll mention a whole bunch of those at the end here, right? Many devoted Christians and well-respected Christians through history have not come to this conclusion. So what are we to believe? That the Holy Spirit has not been guiding them? Has been, has been guiding them down the wrong path to the wrong conclusions? And only this very select small group of Christian theologians and scientists have been led by the Holy Spirit to the truth, right? And to they're the only ones that can actually know that they're right. All right, so third point would be spiritual discernment. All right, this article cites 1 Corinthians 2.14 to argue that understanding young earth creation requires spiritual discernment, implying those that who disagree lack that spirit, you know, spiritual insight. And this perspective could be seen as creating what a false dichotomy between faith and reason. After all, like I just said, there's many, many individuals, especially today, who don't agree or have not come to that conclusion about how to interpret scripture. It was their hermeneutic methodology doesn't lead them to this must be the truth, right? That they know that that must be right 24 hour. Now, many of them don't say that I know that I'm right, that the world is older than that. Some leave it being basically open, like the scriptures don't necessarily say and don't require us to have a particular belief, right? There is a truth that the scriptures aren't interested. Maybe the, the scriptural authors, God isn't interested in communicating that to us. And therefore, we can't really know simply by divine revelation how old the earth is. And maybe the Holy Spirit is also uninterested in leading us to absolute certainty on that as well. It's not an important aspect of, of salvation, of connection with God. All right? So, um, yeah, requires some spiritual discernment. And I do think this does create a dichotomy between faith and reason, as if like all these other people through church history who uh, reason through things have reason to the wrong answer. Uh, this also requires some humility and knowledge. Speaking of humility, how do you stay humble? Right? Again, the article uses 1 Corinthians 8, 1 then to caution against arrogance stemming from knowledge. Well, this promotes, you know, this promotion of a type of humility, I, I think is commendable. The context implies that only young earth creationists possess this true knowledge. And that might seem somewhat contradictory. Right? They're the only ones who can, who have this truth, right? And possess this true knowledge. Um, they're the only ones that are required to, to stay humble, I guess. And so in a, in a similar vein, I'd say number four, this does, I think, ha is a very limited view of divine revelation, right? By emphasizing direct spiritual illumination, the article might really be undervaluing other forms of divine revelation, including general revelation through nature and diverse interpretations of scripture. Through, the, isn't the Holy Spirit working with theologians who spend their time trying to understand scripture and develop a fuller, better understanding of what the authors are or intending to teach us? And if the majority of those serious scholars don't agree with this young earth position, 
aren't you limiting then your view of what divine revelation uh, is, is doing, what spiritual illumination is doing through history, what the Holy Spirit's action is doing and leading to? Maybe the Holy Spirit's action is actually leading to a fuller, better, more, uh, more in-depth, deeper understanding of our place in this universe, in this world. That is apart from this young earth creationism. I think there's also real potential for circular reasoning here. Well, oh, not real potential. It is a form of circular uh, reasoning, right? The argument is that one knows the earth is young because the Holy Spirit reveals it. Only creation scientists actually know the world is young because the Holy Spirit is revealing it, directly revealing it in a, in a supernatural way to them. Therefore, they become the only uh, holders of this truth. Right? And anybody who disagrees, what can they say about them? They lack spiritual discernment. The Holy Spirit is not with them. The Holy Spirit is not helping them to discern this truth. Now, they can pray that others will be led by the Holy Spirit to the truth that they have, right? But they have to admit that the Holy Spirit has not given them that truth, right? So it's kind of circular. It's like you can't know the world is young until you have been led by the Holy Spirit to believe so. And then, of course, once the Holy Spirit believes, well, then, of course, you know that's the truth. Um, and it's, and it's, like I said, it's easy to argue that anybody else who doesn't believe, well, it's simply that the Holy Spirit hasn't given you that yet. You may be incredibly smart. You may be a, an amazing Christian in so many other ways, but for some, the Holy Spirit has not sort of transformed you, right? You haven't, been, you haven't been sanctified in this particular area of your life. I think it also, and this article is just, it, I mean, this is just a little tiny blurb. It was in Answers uh, you know, magazine. I think these are kind of kind of trite responses to sort of like make yourself feel better like about why we have the truth. You know, we're up against the world, which includes the vast majority of, of the Christian community. Right. And so if you believe the world is young, but you're constantly being, you know, hit and berated from around you by all these things, it's, you know, the secular world and even the Christian world saying like, you know, dinosaurs really did die out a long time ago. Uh, you feel like you're under attack. And to be able to say, like, I've got the Holy Spirit, you know, none of you, none of the rest of you have. But talk about how, talk about a situation where it may be a little hard to stay humble. <laughs> you know, it's like, God, I know the truth. And uh, I'm special because there's not many of us that have been given this truth. Yeah, it seems like there's fewer and fewer of us, in fact, that have this truth. The Holy Spirit doesn't seem to be expanding this truth. It seems to be contracting. It's like the rest of the world doesn't deserve this truth. Only a few individuals, you know, have been given this truth. So this is a this is a oversimplification of a complex issue complex understanding of of these these theological issues is, is questions about how the holy spirit works to sanctify individuals to help them to come to understand things because he has given us mind it's not completely we're not mindless individuals who are just like believe this and don't have any argument for your faith don't don't have any rational argument for your faith don't have any evidence for your faith right we're, we're called to have that um, so I think this article presents a really binary view, right? It's either young earth creationism or not. Uh, there, there can't be any diversity of thought. There can't be any diversity of interpretation of God's word here because we simply have the truth. All other interpretations must be false. So it doesn't, doesn't acknowledge any spectrum of beliefs. Um, and this kind of thinking is what leads, you know, um, sex to develop within Christianity because there's always other issues in which you're convinced it's wrong. You're right. Right. And if you, and if, and if you're using this argument that the Holy spirit is the thing that's led you to be right, well, well, God has told you you're right. And if you're right, I mean, you, you can't help, but like tell other people they're wrong. Right. Cause it's important that you, that you know the truth and you only, you have been given it. Also, this suggests that only young earth creationists, as I said before, have spiritual discernment. And so it really does develop into a divisive thing within the broader uh, Christian community. 
um, there's sort of a tension too between what is humility and certainty. And th this is always a, a really difficult thing to balance, you know, in, in the Christian life is, is, is the ability to, to be humble, all right, but be certain in one's faith as well. I'm going to say there's, a, there's a, the core important parts of the gospel for which we should be absolutely confident in. And we should be, uh, you know, like, as it, well, in Paul's language, like boastful of it. It's like we, we know, right? And we can be confident that we can stand on, we can stand firm on that. But there's all kinds of secondary issues for which the church has worked through um, and there's been diversity of thought, but it's so tempting to think like, well, there must be one truth. And if I know that one truth, then I need to convert all others to that particular truth. It, it's hard to hold oneself in the unknown like, and, and to accept that I might not know the truth. We don't do a very good job in the church. So, you know, there's... As I said before, there's this tension between humility, humility and certainty. And the article advocates for humility, of course, here, but it simultaneously is doing what? It's asserting absolute certainty in its interpretation, right? And so this, this leads to the feeling of a paradox. Now, I think that there are individuals who can, who can do this. I know people who are confident and bold, all right, in the truths that they know. Um, but those truths that they know, they would say like, yes, they are derived from like, you know, the Holy Spirit leading them to that. But it also comes with, hey, here's a whole bunch of evidence that supports my particular and, and bolsters my confidence. I might say it originates from the Holy Spirit is the one that drew me to um, a, a particular understanding of Scripture and a knowledge. It gave me true faith. You know, before I might have, I might have been able to see these truths in the sense of like in an objective sort of way that they, I didn't truly believe them, have faith in that. So I have truth and faith and I have evidence and I have, um, you know, I have an argument, you know, for my faith. That's a rational, reasonable argument because God's given us reason, reason minds. So I know people that can do that and maintain a sense of humility in the sense that um, these are things that I I would love you to know, and I want to, I'm not simply going to tell you like, the Holy Spirit led me to this, and therefore you shall believe this. Um, and actually, if you believe that, you should have a certain level of humility, which I think is actually part of this article, which is uh, until the Holy Spirit hits you, you're not going to have the same confidence that I have. And so I can't be arrogant about you not understanding. All I can do is show you the truth. But here's the thing that happens with, I think, a lot of people in Answers in Genesis and a lot of people on some topics like these, hot topics like this, is they're so sure of themselves. And it's more like just like hounding you with like, you have to believe and no patience there at all. There really isn't any humbleness. It's, it's more of an urgency to, to show that I'm right, you're wrong, you need to change your mind. And although theoretically they might they might be able to answer the they might be able to uh, um, they might be able to articulate that is really the Holy Spirit that needs to lead them and they can't do that themselves that you know they can they can give evidences and so forth but they don't have any patience with the Holy Spirit right which then makes them look not humble <laughs> but makes them look arrogant. Um, now, of course, the biggest problem is, what if you're confident you're right, but you're wrong, right? Then it's even worse if you're not humble. There's one thing to say, like, if, you're, if, you're, if you believe you're right, but you're also humble, at least that ameliorates some of the effects of you being wrong. <laughs> it's like, um, but when you're wrong, when you've come to a wrong conclusion, but you believe that God absolutely is telling you that's correct, and then you're telling everyone else in such an arrogant fashion that they absolutely have to believe what you believe, and you're wrong about that, that's where the damage is done. Right? That's where the serious damage is done within the church. All right, now I'll leave it at this, um, because I, I said this before, but... Um, you know, to, to make this argument that the Holy Spirit is leading them to absolute knowledge of a young earth, right, is to, is to say that 
John Stott, N.T. Wright, Tim Keller, William Lane Craig, Francis Collins, Alistair McGrath, John Walton, Hugh Ross, Bruce Waltke, C.S. Lewis. Now, these are just contemporary folks. Well, C.S. Lewis is a little bit 50, 75 years ago. All right, are all wrong that the Holy Spirit is, is not has not led them right. In fact, has led them in the wrong path. Um, or historically, Charles Hodge, B.B. Warfield, James Ott, George Frederick Wright, right? Uh, Hugh Miller, Asa Gray. We could go on and on and on. Right? These folks all have been, who are devoted Christians, but have disagreed with the interpretation of Scripture, well, feel that there isn't a necessity, that the Scripture does not necessitate a certain view of exactly how the earth originated. Right, which leaves it then up to us to use the faculties we've been given to figure that out. And right now, those faculties have led us to a majority view that the earth is very, very old and was formed in a certain fashion. And that might still be wrong. Might learn later that there's a different understanding. And, and, if, and if we're wrong, it doesn't change Scripture at all. If Scripture is not intending to teach us exactly what the origins, the physical origins of the world are. But for Answers in Genesis, this article pretty much sums it up. This is how you can understand the attitude that you get from Answers in Genesis, especially the attitude they have toward other Christians. Right? It's almost like they can be somewhat humble to non-Christians because they, they want to reach out to them and say, like, you know, they're, they're trying to... Um, do an apologetic approach to the non-Christian, it's almost like they've given up on other Christians in a way. It's almost like the Holy Spirit's almost covering them. You know, that's almost like keeping them from understanding the truth. Right? Because why do godly creation scientists, the ones that have the truth, why do they believe God created the world in six 24-hour days? Because the Holy Spirit taught them the truth. And all of the Christians have not yet been taught that truth. And this sets the scene, this sets the stage for how Ken Ham operates and feels about other Christians. Now, he could learn a little lesson from this particular uh, thing here about being humble, right? Um, there's really nothing humble about his approach to other Christians who disagree. I mean, he should be treating them as simply... Christians who, um, who the Holy Spirit has worked in them to understand many things about uh, the necessity of, of Jesus as their Lord and Savior and the, and the essential elements of the gospel, right? And simply hasn't worked out, you know, all the other things that, they, that, that are truths. But maybe that should be an indication to us. Maybe that should be an indication to Ken Ham that, that, that a belief in a young earth is not a salvific most important question all right it's not central to the gospel Ken Ham was a little he was always kind of quick to say that yeah you can believe in an old earth and you could still be a christian you're a misguided christian but really the more you hear him talk you realize that no he really thinks that something terribly wrong like if you don't really finally find your way to understand the earth is young he really has doubts about your true Christian faith, because there's, you know how many times you'll find on the Answers in Genesis website, so-called Christian, you know, <laughs> you know, it's like this so-called Christian, which I've been referred to as a so-called Christian on the Answers, well, I think those exact words have been used on the Answers in Genesis website, right? Because it, you can't really be a Christian if you believe these things, if you don't have this truth that they have. Uh, yeah, I think, I think we can leave it there. So short little blurb. This is an old article republished today on the Answers in Genesis website. Um, how do I stay humble when I know I'm right? And again, I, I, I struggle with this. I think we all, there are all time, well, certainly the way people are on social media and all that, everyone thinks that they know that they're right. And there's not a lot of whole, hum, not a lot of humbleness here, but 
you know, these are questions of, you know, the, the, the stakes are raised when we're talking about like ultimate questions. And for Kenham, like the age of the earth is an ultimate question. And they know that they're right. Um, you know, can they take their own advice though? How can they stay humble? This is, this is a huge challenge. Uh, and I'll just say it again. I think that this article, I mean, if, if you read this, you're like, okay, now I know what to do. I've got the tools to remain humble, even though I can, and, and know that I'm absolutely right about something. And no, you know, one would hope that there'd be a lot of other follow-up stuff that, that would give you some kind of deeper knowledge here. I think this shows kind of the lightweight theological work that uh, Answers in Genesis has. They, they bring in all kinds of people that write this stuff that is kind of nonsensical, really. It's theologically shallow. Uh, doesn't give you any nuance at all. And so that might kind of sound kind of nice when you read it, but then when you go out in your daily life and you actually deal with people, you actually deal with other Christians who have differences of opinion, and you think about how to apply this, very difficult. Doesn't really provide you with actual practical tools for doing that. Uh, all right, that's my critique of this form of creationism for today. Thanks for listening. Subscribe, like, if you kind of like it. <laughs> and um, we'll talk to you later. Have a great day. God bless everybody out there. Bye-bye.